Hello and welcome back to another episode of Felpos Sunday here on the World War II History and Reenacting YouTube channel. Well, this episode was supposed to air a few weeks ago and I've been having some troubles uploading to YouTube and I've been really busy at work and I've not had the time to try to figure out why. So, yeah, but now it looks like everything is working again. If you're watching this video, I guess everything is back to normal and uh, <laughs> I had to reshoot this intro because, well, now it's December and uh, <laughs> yeah, I really apologize for there being a lack of Felpo Sunday videos lately, but that's the reason. So enough blah blah blah, let's get into the video and see if there's any Felpost. You ready? Hmm. Nothing. Hmm. Wait a second. That sounds like an Opel Blitz outside. I was fortunate enough to get my hands on this original German Luftwaffe Soldatenspind from the Second World War. It's pretty much in overall untouched condition, except for some post-war padlock latches. But to my surprise, it still retained its original finish and internal parts, which made me very, very happy. Even the Norwegian Wildcat seems to approve. The locker is well marked, and it's no question to whom it belonged to, the German Luftwaffe. Both of the doors and the inside of the locker is marked with the exact same stamp burnt into the wood. FLUV stands for Flieger Unterkunftsverwaltung, or the Flight Barracks Administration, the agency responsible for Luftwaffe accommodations, and it's dated 1940. I'm not sure who made the locker, if it was made in Germany and shipped over, or if it was commissioned locally, which was actually quite common. There are no other markings to be found. This locker originates from a German airfield here in the south of Norway. Following the German invasion of Norway on the 9th of April 1940, the Luftwaffe began expanding their infrastructure, and the work started immediately. The particular German airfield where this locker originates from was finished by the end of July 1940 and consisted of plane hangars, barracks for personnel and a 950 by 40 meter long runway constructed with wooden planks. The airfield remained as an important and strategic base until the summer of 1941, when it was eventually replaced by a larger airfield a few miles away. Even though it was no longer considered a main airfield in the area, it was still utilized as a reserve, training and emergency airfield throughout the war. After the war, this locker somehow ended up in the hands of a local guy that lived in the area. And now, it's part of my collection and a piece of local military history. I believe that this locker might have belonged to a pilot or an officer, based on what I can observe from looking at the inside. We will touch upon these points regarding why I think so in greater detail later in the video, 
but I would like to address it shortly here in the introduction as well. There are no traces of there ever being hooks for hanging various field gear related items inside the doors, as there should be according to the soldiers locker guidelines. Even Luftwaffe ground personnel, such as mechanics, were issued standard field equipment, so I'm guessing this locker could have belonged to a pilot, a member of the flying personnel, or any other officer who were not issued these items. When I received the locker, it was dirty, dusty, and full of spider webs, but a quick vacuum and a washdown made it look almost as good as new. The internals of the locker are still intact, which is actually quite rare, as many lockers were converted to civilian use after the war, and for some reason, the layout was apparently not always satisfactory. Like for instance, these small internal locker doors are sadly often missing, but this one is still present and in great shape. Here is a close-up of the hinges and hardware. Some nice details and craftsmanship went into these basic military lockers. Just look at this five-piece door, consisting of a piece of plywood and four boards assembled with corner bridle joints. The same goes for the door below as well. Well made and a perfect fit. There are also some very nice details in the main clothing compartment, like this wooden hanging rod for clothing, as well as a row of hooks in the back. Note the air vent in the back wall covered with insect netting. Here are some close-ups showing various details found on the locker doors. The left door has two of these locking latches, one at the top and one at the bottom. Something was once hanging here, maybe a photo of a loved one, a poster or perhaps a calendar, who knows. Here is a look at the hinges seen from the outside. I must say, the installation of these hinges is beautifully done. The beautiful original dark brown finish is still intact, something that is quite rare to see. Normally furniture like this was as stated previously, reused after the war by civilians or military, and was in most cases sadly repainted. It's a very heavy and solid piece of furniture. This particular locker measures roughly over 2 meters tall, 1 meter wide and 50 centimeters deep, and probably weighs close to 80 kilos. Just look at this heavy duty top header board and crowned molding trim. The side, bottom and top boards are joined together using half blind dovetail joints, which some people might consider to be an overcomplicated joining method for a soldier's locker. But hey, quality lasts, right? The backside is covered by a single piece of plywood. An interesting detail is that the pencil lines from the assembly of the locker showing the internal layout are still visible. Here is a close up of the vent holes seen from the backside. There is some slight water damage to the lower part of the rear plywood panel and some slight molding, but nothing that can't be stabilized and cleaned up. As you can see, the wooden feet have been reinforced with what appears to be a piece of zinc plating, which has been bent to shape and nailed down. Let's start by removing some of the non-original features that were added after the war, probably because they could not find the key to the original lock. This thing was also not original so I removed it. Hmm, this padlock latch looks familiar. It was at some point removed from here. One of the door hinges on the left closet door was loose and there were some screws missing so we got that sorted out as well. Then the padlock latch we previously removed from the door was reinstalled in its original place.
The old screws were bent, beat up and rusted, so I was forced to use some new ones. Luckily, I found some identical period old stock screws among my grandfather's tools. I assume you might be interested in knowing more about what the soldier kept in his locker, and what was stored in each compartment, etc. Well, there were of course regulations and guidelines to be followed, something that could vary widely from branch of service, unit-specific moderations, and of course also depending on the type and style of the locker. But for this locker, which is the exact same model seen in the Luftwaffe manuals, we will base this locker tour on the regulations from 1937, which was in fact in use at least until 1941, but probably remained unchanged throughout the war. On the top of the locker, the soldier would store his helmet and backpack, with his wool blanket and ten quarter, aka selpan, inside. I am unsure what an officer or pilot would store up here, maybe a suitcase or a helmet if he had one. A regular Luftwaffe officer would in most cases have a helmet, with regards to the pilot, I'm not sure. It also does not say in the manual where the gas mask canister was to be stored. But in many photos, I see that it was commonly stored on top as well. The upper left compartment was for the visor cap, with a clothing brush on the left and a pair of gloves on the right. This next compartment is where I found the standard to deviate the most from the guidelines training outfit, sports outfit, side cap, and I think this was where one stored undergarments like underwear, etc. Please correct me if I'm wrong. The meal or food compartment, which is behind this neat little door, was used to store food and other food related items, such as cutlery and other tableware, such as plates, coffee cups, etc. Note that this compartment has its own dedicated air vent in the back, covered with insect netting. Below the meal compartment is the so-called private compartment, for valuables and personal items, such as watches, wallets, photos, letters, harmonicas, cameras, tobacco items, and various other valuables and personal belongings. This compartment could and should be locked, in this case with a padlock. The fourth compartment from the top held all the hygiene related items, such as uniform washing detergent, soap, shaving kit, hair products, medicine, combs, toothbrush, etc. The compartment below was for literature. It could hold both regular civilian books, as well as military-related manuals, songbooks, etc. Pencils, pens, inks, writing paper, and other writing materials was also to be stored in this compartment. A washing bag was to be stored in the compartment below, according to the regulations, but on original photos it appears that this compartment was more often used to store either trousers or the sports and training outfits. I chose to use it to store trousers for this demonstration. The bottom compartment was used to store various maintenance related items, which were usually contained in a separate miniature cabinet, which had three drawers. The top drawer would contain shoe polish, brushes, and other letter care products. The middle drawer would contain sewing related items, such as needle and thread, and spare buttons, for maintaining uniforms and equipment. The lower drawer would contain the rifle cleaning kit, and other related cleaning products and equipment. In many cases seen on original photos, the separate cabinet is absent, and the items are just placed in the compartment in a similar manner to my example. In what I will call the main compartment is where the different uniforms were stored, 
as well as other miscellaneous items. The hook rack in the back is not mentioned in the manual locker guidelines, and original photos show many different variations. I set this example up for a pilot or an officer, and chose to hang a double-pronged officer's belt and a map case. One can probably also hang a sword or dagger here as well. Moving along, of course, the uniforms had to hang in a specific order as well. All the way to the right, we have an overcoat, but since this is an officer, we have a private purchase leather coat instead of the regular issued wool overcoat. In fact, this coat actually belonged to a Luftwaffe pilot that served at the same airfield, which is pretty cool. Who knows? Maybe this leather coat was hanging in this exact cabinet during the war. Next would be the walking out uniform, in this case, a white officer's summer uniform. Next, the Fliegerbluse. By the way, don't mind the different ranks on the uniforms. Lastly, a regular soldier would have had a work uniform hanging here. A lot of original photos also show trousers and shirts hanging here. Note that an officer or other specialist personnel could possibly have had more or and different uniforms hanging in this section. For instance, would the pilot or other members of the flying personnel store their flying suits, boots and other equipment in their private lockers? Or would they have a different locker or store them somewhere else? If anybody knows, please let me know in the comments. On the bottom of this compartment we find the shoe storage area. Walking out dress shoes, sport shoes, winter boots, officer boots, etc. I've seen many original photos showing many different shoes and layout combinations used here. There is even a photo showing a pair of slippers. According to the regulations, the items that was to be hung on the inside of the right door was as follows. From the top, bayonet, belt and Y straps, hand towel, K98 pouches, and the bread bag with the canteen mounted upside down with the cap unscrewed. Note that the exact placement and also the contents of the items varied widely, but for the most part, the concept of having these items hanging on the right door remained a standard for those who had these items issued to them. But on this door, there are no signs or holes from any hooks or nails. For this demonstration, I tied a piece of string between them and hung a hand towel over it considering there has been no other mounting possibilities than these two hooks, I think it's safe to assume, as I mentioned earlier, that this Soldatenspind probably belonged to an individual that had a limited amount of standard field gear issued. It's the same with regards to the left door. There are no other signs of nails or hooks, other than the two identical hooks positioned in the same place as on the right door. According to the manual, this door is not utilized for anything. But original photos show otherwise. It was apparently common for the soldier to have it decorated with pictures, posters or calendars. But occasionally there is a similar setup to what is seen on my locker, with two hooks or nails joined with a piece of string, to hang hand towels, ties, detachable collars, etc. I chose to hang a calendar, necktie and a flashlight on the door for this demonstration. This setup was based on an original photo. Let's round up this locker tour with an interesting Soldatenspind fact. In the SS, it was illegal to lock your spind, because you should be able to trust your fellow soldiers and thievery was forbidden. If you could not trust your Kameraden with leaving your stuff alone, how could you trust them in combat? In the rest of the armed forces, on the other hand, it was mandatory to lock your spind. And if you forgot and the UFO Dev found it unlocked, you would be in serious trouble. So I hope you enjoyed this video and I wish you a Merry Christmas and Happy Holidays and until next time, Auf Wiedersehen! Zerstörerflugzeuge sichern in ständigen Überwachungsflügen das unübersichtliche Küstengelände zur Luft.